Hello again everyone and this is the Vintage Sewing Machine Garage. Uh, you are looking at, uh, no surprise, one of my favorite uh, vintage sewing machine models from the 1970s. It's one of the only favorites I have from the 70s. I have made uh, many videos on this series of machines before and uh, I when I see them, I, I will reach out and think, oh, maybe I should rescue this because I have mentioned in the past that um, I, I consider these machines to be the equal of Bernina. And that's a pretty bold statement to make, I know, and there are people who will disagree. However, uh, this was, I believe, Sears' attempt at having a machine that would not only have lots of features, but would have certain things that made it unique and special. Some of the machines of this era I've seen on on the, the flatbed that, that were not free arms, like this one, they even have a little uh, channel groove similar to the way Bernina did. Uh, they developed the super high shank foot design, and they did this, I believe, to mimic the fact that Bernina sewing machines <clears throat> can only use Bernina feet. <coughs> And so uh, this machine is incredible. It is, uh, I believe I've called it the last of the Mohicans in other videos. It is the last of the great all metal machines. And I mean, all of the drivetrain inside is steel. Uh, eventually, um, this is early 1970s. I would say this is 1974-ish, 75. Uh, it's 1976. You have some of the last of these machines made, being manufactured in Japan. Um, after that, by the late 70s, they moved the production to Taiwan, which would not necessarily have been a, a, a negative, except that they started using more plastic, and you see them gradually bring plastic in. And not only to things like knobs, which is not a big deal. Machines have had plastic knobs for many years, and that's not an issue. It's the mechanical parts that you want to be steel. Uh, some people are fine with plastic parts, and that's that's all well and great. But when you're looking at a vintage machine, something that is many decades old, and if you were going to invest time restoring a machine of your own, or if you're going to pay someone like myself who does this, or maybe you take it to a, a sewing machine repair place, uh, very few of those places will do a full restoration overhaul because their costs are too high and the labor would be uh, outrageous. But that might be an option for you. One of the things I love about these machines is that they, um, they're very flexible. Now I have, let me sort of see it off here to the side, I have the, uh, the uh, slide on uh, end of the bed that creates a full bed for this machine. What is rare about this? Well, these machines were sold in great numbers. So why do I say this one, this particular one is rare? It's not the machine because again, Sears was a huge player in the sewing machine world. Uh, they had a, an incredible array of models that they offered, different price points. Curiously, uh, by the time we get into the 70s, sewing machine companies are starting to make machines that are very proprietary in terms of the carrying cases they use, the sewing tables they use. And the reason I say this particular one is rare is because it came with, when I got it, it, it came with a sewing table. Sewing tables were, you know, you, you see them very often. They were very costly, but people bought them and typically kept them over the years once they had a machine. However, by the time you get to the 70s, I, I'm not entirely sure why this is, but I have noticed that with all of these machines that I have that I have rescued and restored, I would say a good 80 to 90 percent of them have carry cases or nothing. Now they are very friendly to use on a table. In fact, this machine can be removed from this sewing table, and you can put it right on a dining table and use it, uh, and that's not a big deal. This particular table design is interesting, and sometimes you will see. Um, uh, these machines sold with a table or sometimes you'll see the table but as I've mentioned in other videos if you do not have that that wonderful knurled I think I think one of my viewers uh, told me it was called a knurled bolt 
Anyway, it's a big bolt that, that mounts this machine to this, uh, the, the lower section in here of the table. And that's the only way you can use this to store the machine. And very often those bolts, people would take the machine out because they wanted to, I don't know, maybe take it to a friend's house or go to some sewing club, who knows, and they would lose the bolt. The bolt would get, you know, and it, and it doesn't look like it goes to anything else. In fact, I'm sure some of these bolts are sitting around in boxes all across North America somewhere, and people have no idea what they're for. If you find them on eBay, those bolts I'm referring to, they're very expensive because typically if they're being sold, the sellers know that if you want to mount one of these machines in a table, then you are going to need that bolt uh, or a bolt that's equivalent to it anyway. Um, anyway, what you are looking at, of course, is the uh, Kenmore uh, 158.1941, and it has, as what you would expect, of course, it has stitch length. By the time we get to the 70s, we've got much longer stitch length options than you do, say, in the 1930s, right? The, 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 the straight stitch of most sewing machines, the further back you go, the shorter they were, generally speaking. There are exceptions to this. Up here, of course, you have stitch width, and you have a reverse, and it is spring-loaded like many, so you hold it down to, to, you know, to back tack or, or lock in your stitch. And then, of course, you will see, let's, let's zoom in here so you can see what it says, with special stitches. Now, You'll notice the, the color, there's a color orange here. I think it's showing up on the camera for you. You're gonna see white and orange, sort of this uh, reddish orange color. Uh, the red side, and you can see this little, uh, uh, basically sampling of patterns, that is for what we would call normal um, stitches, okay? Um, and by normal, what I mean is they have normal tension built into them. Uh, now, what is this other side, right? That's the white dot, and that is special stitches. By the 1970s, people were really into sewing knits. And knitwear became a thing. Well, sewing knits, which are, which are, which are fabrics that stretch, um, they do not... Uh, tolerate traditional lock stitch sewing machines. That's what a that's what a traditional sewing machine does. It, it's technically the straight stitches and the zigzag and all the deck. They're called lock stitches. They lock they're locked into the fabric and they're used for wovens, and they work beautifully and they still do to this day. Many of you use them, but in order to sew knits, you can sew knits with a with a with a uh, traditional lock stitch machine, but it's a little trickier and you really kind of have to. Uh, put your put your practice time in. People were frustrated with that, and so in the 70s, when it's become popular, they they created what they called reverse stitches, or I believe they're called stretch stitches. And what they what they do, and I think I've demonstrated this in different videos in the past, and I'll try to remember to do that again when I when I hopefully get this machine ready and done and finished, is that they build in slack. To the, to, the, to the stitch so that when those knits stretch, hopefully you get uh, a seam that will stretch with the fabric and not pop the stitches, which is very common when you're using a traditional lock stitch, lock stitch machine. Oh boy, that's a mouthful. Well, of course this adds mechanical uh, 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 fanciness to the machine. And this would have been a pretty expensive machine. Most of the people that bought these, they went into Sears, they would have had to make payments on them. But they are incredible. Made in Japan, uh, most of the sewing machine manufacturing in the 70s had, most of it, had moved to Japan. Uh, and, and actually, within a decade, it was going to move from Japan to Taiwan and has now moved to China and other countries in South Asia. But this is uh, one of those machines that, uh, it has lots of multi-stitch capability. It, this is an example of a machine I often suggest to people who, let's say they, they are really, uh, they have a modern sewing machine, one of the, the current ones, and they love all the different features because modern sewing machines do have some conveniences. Um, and they have far more possible stitches than say a traditional lock stitch machine would. Well, 
you can actually get an analog, non-computerized uh, machine that can do a lot of those things, not all, but many of those functions can be done with a machine like this. Now, I want to see if I can demonstrate this table. This table is kind of interesting. It would not have been cheap to buy in 1974, 75. Uh, you will notice that the table is uh, sort of a walnut, um, it's a, a laminate product. And back then, this, this type of furniture was all the rage and it was quite expensive because it was billed because you didn't have to wax it. And you don't, it's laminate. You don't need to polish it or wax it. And that was the big selling point. Anyway, back to the machine. I'm going to pull, pull my camera back a bit because I want to hopefully see you, have you watch me move this. So it's a bit fascinating. I've got, remember to always keep your free arm access to your bobbin area closed when you're moving things around with these machines. So there's a little uh, button that's spring-loaded here. I'm going to put my finger in there, and I'm going to lift up. And when I do, this panel, which many of you know, you're not, you're not new to this idea, this flips up. And notice that the machine is not sliding because it, is, it has that, that special magic bolt that I told you is so hard to find. And then, of course, when the machine is going to be folded into the table, it, it, is, it is also on a heavy spring. Um, and then I can tilt it down. And when I do, it will go all the way basically flat, perpendicular to us. And then I close the, the um, I cl you can close the table up like you would most sewing tables. But when you pull up, the spring helps you pick it up because it's a fairly heavy machine. There's, there's a lot of steel inside. There's also aluminum. But again, it's a bigger thing. It's just a bigger beast of a machine because it's got a lot more going on inside. When I pull up, it's kind of interesting. You can actually pull this up, push this, and you can tilt the machine. You pull it up and tilt it towards you, and you can push this panel down and then rest the machine, and you have, you actually have, sorry about that little wiggle there, you have the machine set up so that when you're using that free arm that people were so just going crazy over, um, you have full access to it. Now, let's say you're not. Let's say you are going to sew with this, not with the free arm, but with this, um, these are called convertibles for a reason, right? So you put this in, this little cap goes on. Let's say you want to sew with this, but you obviously this hump is, is uh, the whole purpose of having a sewing table is so that you don't have to have your fabric hanging. So I'm going to come up and this time I'm going to tilt, of course I'm going to tilt the machine forward and now I'm going to let this piece rest as I drop it down. Now the piece has, basically there's two decks. There's two levels. And so if you're going to sew flat, this is the flat version of this machine. This is how it works. And it's a, it's a rather clever design to give you all of these options. Now I can still remove this. This was designed so that you can get in here. Oh, you know, when your bobbin runs out of thread, you can access it quite easily. And so, again, you know, if, if, if I say the word Sears today or Kenmore, you know, some of you might think, what is wrong with you? Why would you compare this to, to a Swiss Bernina? But remember, you have to go back and consider what kind of retailer Sears was back in the day and the quality that went into their products because people were still using department stores and department stores had really, really um, solid uh, levels of guarantee and warranty on their products that they really don't have today. There are exceptions, you know, companies like L.L. Bean still do this, satisfaction guaranteed, but many don't anymore. It's really sad and, and obviously you could not sell junk if you were putting a, an incredible guarantee. I think this, these came with 25 year warranties, but obviously it's been more than 25 years and these machines still sew beautifully. This one currently does not. Now, you might say, well, why is that? Uh, people often ask me about the sewing machines and A, you know, how are they priced? Why are they priced the way they are? And <clears throat> is it okay you know, if I get a vintage machine, is it going to be 
broken? You know, can I not just take it home and sew with it? And the answer is very complex because occasionally, particularly if you know someone who sews and they said, hey, I'm going to, you know, I'm going to sell some of my machines. Are you interested? And usually um, if a machine is being used, it's, it's, it can be, be careful, I don't want to make absolute statements here. It can be in great condition and maybe it just needs a little cleaning and oiling. That, and notice I said maybe. When I look at a machine that I'm going to purchase to overhaul, it doesn't matter how beautiful it is. It doesn't matter how clean it is. I can never assume its condition and that's why I like to poke around and look at it and test it. You've, you've all have seen me do this in videos before. So, um, it's ironic, more time goes into a, to restoring a multi-stitch machine like this, even more into uh, machines like German Pfaff's and Swiss Bernina's, specifically because those machines were engineered in a way that makes it extra difficult to get to them. You can service them, it just takes me even more hours. But a machine like this will take far more hours for me to overhaul than say a very simple black straight stitch singer. I'm being very general here. There's always exceptions, but there's just more going on, right? There, there's far more for me to, to overhaul. And very often what happens is people will buy a machine. Oh, it's, you know, they'll see it and they'll see it maybe a good price or someone just wants to get rid of it. Maybe they see it at a yard sale or who knows. And they'll get it. They get it home and their expectations are that they can just plug it in and sew with it. And of course, very often they cannot and they are disappointed and they sometimes get frustrated. And sometimes, sadly, they'll throw it away, which is a horrible thing to do. But they don't understand that these machines were built in a time when many consumer products were simply designed to have service. They require service. Now, all of the things I do to a machine is not something you have to worry about for normal maintenance and service. That would be a lot. Typically, just keeping the feed dog area clean and keeping the machine oiled is typically all you have to do for very, very long periods. The, the uh, procedures that I use on machines are typically for machines like this where they have been sitting for a long time. They're not broken, but I like to, to call them, I, I describe them as being asleep. And so here's an example. Let's take a look. And, and you all have seen me do this many times. Typically, when you turn, very often, you won't have much problem turning the, this is the tension, uh, um, upper thread tension assembly, right? Beautifully made. Typically, they are not, uh, now they you have to inspect them and you need to clean them, but they are not typically uh, stuck or bound unless there's a thread jam or something, uh, which rarely happens on these because uh, they, they do not really involve a lot of uh, gunked up oil because you don't put oil in between, say, the tension discs. So where else do we want to check? Well, here's my stitch length adjuster. And this thing is very stiff. Notice I'm having, see it's just barely moving. This, uh, I can try it now. This is moving my feed dogs, my reverse, but it's stiff. It's, and this is my zigzag or um, uh, stitch width adjustment. And it is very stiff. Now, can I try to make them work? Yeah, but I'm not going to. And you all, who, those of you who know my channel know, and I, and I, and I, just I preach this constantly. You can take a perfectly good machine like this one, and if you if you you just grab a hold of it and you start trying to make it run, you know I have the foot pedal and the cord. They're in beautiful shape. I can plug it in, but it the machine doesn't want to run yet because it's not ready. And if you will have patience uh, to do to overhaul the machine yourself or have someone like me do that for you, you will discover that the machine is very ready to work. It just needs to be given the maintenance uh, that, it, that it is overdue for because it has been sitting for a long time. It's not unlike an automobile. A car that's been sitting for years is not necessarily broken, but you can't just crank it up and drive it, right? Same principle. Uh, but everything I see on the machine, the, you know, the, the power switch, everything looks fantastic. Um, 
everything is here. It even has, oh my goodness, we have, um, it has, this is the insert for when people were going to make buttonholes. It still has the plastic. It is incre entirely possible that this was never even used. You know, it's, it's true even today. Many of us buy things, you know, whether it's an automobile or a who knows, all sorts of things we buy, smartphones, computers, uh, that have all kinds of features. And the people who sell them often talk about, yes, but your old model doesn't have the latest thing. Well, buttonholing was not, not a, a new idea, but, uh, you know, typically people would buy sewing machines and they would sometimes be willing to pay extra for, this would have been the, one of the fanciest models you could buy at Sears in 1974, 75. But the thing was, people didn't always use all those extra features, you know? Um, and as soon as knits went out of style, or, or heavy double knits, the knits that were popular in the 70s, people just didn't sew knits as often, but they still sewed. So as you can see, this machine is, uh, and if I, over here is the hand wheel, and just turning, watch the needle. Let me see if I can get, uh, without tearing down the whole thing. If I can, you can see the needle moving, right? But bare, it's very stiff. What this tells me is I'm not going to plug it in. I'm not going to try to run it. What I am going to do is go through the procedures I go through with every machine, even if everything was moving fine. And I'm going to clean. Uh, most of the, the, the cleaning is going to be down here in the feed dog area and the hook in the race area. But I'll check up here up top <clears throat> and then I will begin oiling and I may use penetrance to break up some of the old oil. But once I've gotten everything moving to my satisfaction and I can move it manually with my fingers, not with electric power, that tells me the machine is waking up. And then I will plug it in and test it and, uh, you know, again, make adjustments until the machine is fully awake and ready to go. And then it's really like new at that point for the purposes of using and sewing with. Uh, you cannot really buy any home sewing machine today that it comes anywhere close to the quality of this. Now, there are expensive machines out there. <clears throat> I often talk about new machines as being cheap and crappy, and most of them are. Uh, if you pay $150 for a new plastic sewing machine, it might work for you for a while, but I would never use the term heirloom. <laughs> um, many of them are sealed. They're very hard to get into. They are designed to be disposable, sadly. Now, there are new machines that are really fancy and can be thousands of dollars, and not just new Berninas. Uh, you know, their brother, Janome, um, Baby Lock, there are many other brands. And some of these machines are quite impressive with the things they can do. And, you know, people take them in for service and they use them. But I still have people who sew who always like to have at least one good old Ironsides vintage heavy duty sewing machine because they know that if they really need to sew extra thick fabrics they can and they're not, not having to worry about software so it's not an either or choice some of you may be interested in learning to sew you have no machine and you're like you're looking at these new machines and you're worried they're not going to last a vintage machine is really a good choice for you and if you have been eyeballing Berninas, vintage Berninas, um, and you, you've heard about how wonderful they are, you may never have even thought about, you know, uh, uh, you know, the lowly Kenmore from Sears, but I would be willing to bet you that this machine will last and is as strong a sewer as any Bernina, home, home Bernina, that any of you can sew with. And uh, again, I, I know I'm kind of, it's like putting a sign on your back that says, kick me. There are people who say, oh, how dare you, you know, Bernina. Uh, I have restored and overhauled Berninas. Uh, the, the, the hourly rate I have to charge to overhaul a Bernina is so high, not just because they're, they, they need restoring, as all machines, that most, most all machines I get do. The Berninas are really extra hard to get access to. It just takes longer to work on them. Um, and getting, you know, you, you have to make sure you can get uh, uh, certain replacement parts can be more difficult on the Berninas. I have not had that problem with Kenmore's, and I'm willing to bet Sears sold more of these than Bernina sold machines in the U.S. simply because um, 
they were so large. You know, it's it's hard to it's it's easy to forget what an amazing retailer Sears once was and the power they had. Um, and uh, and they they offered credit to people. You could open up a Sears account when you were brand new at starting your um, starting your life as an adult. So anyway, I will be going through the process of this, hoping to wake this this old machine up. And uh, I, based on my experience in the past, I am <laughs> I am hopeful. Uh, and and no one put any kind of weird thing like axle grease or any. This is this is typical what you find in vintage sewing machines. Someone had it. They didn't want to part with it, but they stopped sewing, and maybe they left it to a daughter or a granddaughter or a grandson or grand, you know, whoever, and they just, it just sat, and it sat, and it sat, and someone finally said, well, I'm moving, you know, I got to do something with it, you know, and anyway, that is why this machine is sitting in front of me. So, whether it's the double belt system that gives extra power, whether it's the, 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 the you know, the super high shank feet, um, there were so many features of this machine that were Sears' way of saying, well, if we can't sell Bernina, because Bernina is sold only through independent stores, not chain stores, um, Sears decided they would go to Marusin in Japan and have them make a machine that could compete with Bernina. And I think it does. For those of you who have had this machine or Bernina's or both, put your comments down there. Let me know what you think. Um, because if you sew with these machines, I guess your opinion is is certainly quite valid because you know I'm 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 a machine fixer and as any of you have seen in any of my video demonstrations uh, a skilled sewer I am not thanks for watching everyone and stay tuned as I wake this very asleep Kenmore up but once she's awake I think we're gonna have ourselves a fantastic um, state-of-the-art sewing machine for 1974 and uh, I believe this truly qualifies as heirloom quality uh, you could buy this machine, use it, and future generations could continue to do so. Thanks for watching, everyone.